Welcome. Thank you so much for joining our online worship service. My name is Gresford Thomas, and I'm the pastor of the Concord International and San Ramon Valley Seventh-day Adventist Churches. This is a district-wide online service, and, I, and I'm just so proud of the congregations who have come together to allow this worship service to be developed and to be uh, produced and also to be filmed. You're going to see that many have come together to participate in this worship experience. You know, the saying goes that sharing is caring. So if you care for others and would like for them to receive a blessing as well, I'd like to invite you to hit the share button and share it to all of your online friends so that we can come together and have a meaningful, blessed, and large worship online experience. May God bless you as we continue with our worship service. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not. Sabbath. My name is Leandro Lima. I'm from the Concord International Church. I'm here to welcome you all to our online worship service. Um, 
Well, we hope that everyone is doing okay. Um, we, I don't know if everyone knows, but we recently had a baby here. Um, so we have uh, a newborn right now. He's doing well. It's called uh, it's called Daniel. Um, anyways, uh, God has uh, been blessing us. Uh, all the time and we're very thankful for that um, I want to invite you all to um, do a quick prayer so we can start our uh, worship service dear Heavenly Father we thank you for everything you have done um, for our church or churches um, we are thank thankful because you take care of us all the time. You provide everything we need, even though sometimes it's not what we want, but you know what we need. Um, we thank you, Lord, for our pastor, uh, for everything he's doing to our church, and we ask you to bless uh, the leadership, keep blessing the leadership and the pastor and his family. Um, we ask you to bless the service and everyone who's watching. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Um, so I'd like to give a few announcements. Uh, starting from February, uh, we'll, well, we'll continue with the food pantry at SISDAC Concord International. Um, we are located at 1655 West Street in Concord. So starting from February, um, we'll have two um, events each month. So if you know anyone who needs um, food, uh, we're just giving for free. You come with your card and people um, give you some groceries um, that starts um, in February February 6 uh, the first Sabbath of the month and February 20 from 1230 to 2 so twice a month uh, in February on, on February 6th and 20th, we'll have from 12.30 to 2, the SISDAC Food Pantry. Uh, we're also having the Midweek Revelation Bible Study via Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. every Wednesday. So if you're interested in learning more about the Revelation book, uh, and we need it, right? There's, there's so many things happening in the world and people uh, don't know exactly if that's supposed to happen, uh, what's going on. So we, uh, we need to know more and we need to be ready to explain when people come to us asking about what's happening. So every Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m. via Zoom. So the information, the Zoom information will follow every week, will be sent every week with the links. We also have the Thursday prayer meetings from SISDAC. That's every Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, also, every week we're sending the information via Zoom. If you need more information, uh, as Pastor Grassfoot Thomas, everyone is welcome. So, prayer meetings every Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m. So, now as the worship continues, um, I'll leave you with the uh, San Ramon Church welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the San Ramon Valley Seventh day Adventist Church. I'm Heather Hindmarsh. I'd love to welcome you, uh, I'd actually love to welcome you to our church. 
but since we aren't meeting uh, in person, I will welcome you virtually. Enjoy the comfort of your couch. You might want to pull up a nice, lovely um, blanket. It's been so cold lately. And just enjoy the rainy, wintry weather from the comfort of your home. I'd like to welcome everybody, both members and if we have some visitors, I'm going to read a little text to you from the Bible about welcoming everybody. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do even the Gentiles do the same? It's Matthew 4. 546 through 48. So let's not welcome only those that believe like us and are our friends. Let's welcome everyone to our church. And hopefully in another month or two, we can warmly greet them at the door in person. Um, please sit back and enjoy the special music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Celia Wiggle, and I am with Concord International Seventh Day Adventist Church. Now, for our tithes and offerings, I will be reading a very short story. But before that, have you ever attended church in a house? Well, from what I have gathered, there are still some house churches across America today. But then, house churches are very easy to outgrow, right? Listen to this story. One of the house churches in Vermont, the Brattleboro Church, stepped forward by faith in outreach to their community. And the congregation grew, and it became obvious they needed a new location to become even more effective for the Lord. The house itself could no longer handle the various ministries and the growth of the congregation. So they prayed. They brought the matter before the Lord. And a land opened in the adjacent town of Vernon, and the members raised funds to move to the new location. Week by week, the members gave according to their abilities. The church project went forward and construction began on the new building. The new structure started as only a dream in the hearts of the members. Now, faithful members worship in their beautiful building. Well, you see, church members are able to have a wider impact in the community. When God's people uh, come together for the Lord and follow the dream that the Lord has put in their hearts, great things will happen. So today, as we return our tithes and give our offerings, please ask God to place in your heart a vision for our church. Catch the inspiration of how our congregation can bless our community. And for the Concord International Seventh-day Adventist Church, please remember our community services and the member care ministries, for they really need our support. And since we cannot bring our tithes and offerings to the church, we encourage you to go online. Go to AdventistGiving.org, where you can easily give your tithes and offerings with just a few clicks. And if you need uh, assistance in using this Adventist Giving, Please let me or our pastor know about it, and we will email you a step-by-step -step instructional on how to do this. So that's it for now. Happy Sabbath. And uh, next is a video presentation called Put God First. It was God, and not the worshiper, who decided three things about tithe. Tithe percentage, where it should be delivered, and how it is to be used. In the inspired Old Testament model, tithe and offerings were to be brought to a central place, and from there it was equally assigned by God to the Levites for their dedicated work in the sanctuary, configuring the only valid use for the tithe. Under that model, the Israelites were not paying the Levites. They were returning tithe to the Lord as an act of worship, and the Lord was the one who decided how to use it. For this reason, the act of tithing was not affected by the quality of the Levite's service, whether good or bad. Interestingly enough, Jesus clearly supported the practice of tithing, not changing or adding to it. He told the Pharisees that they should not refrain from tithing, while practicing important aspects of the law, such as justice, mercy, and faith. Paul in the New Testament also endorses this model as being commanded by the Lord himself. 
In an age in which we no longer have the Israelite temple or the Levitical service, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has carefully adapted this biblical model in order to provide full support for the gospel ministry in these last days. And it is the only way by which every nation, tribe, tongue, and people may be reached with the good news in the context of the three angels' message. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Hi, this is Linda Sue from San Ramon Valley. And before we have a prayer with God, I wanted to read just um, one scripture taken from Psalms 28, verse 7. And I'm reading from the New King James. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. And I am help helped. <laughs> Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we do indeed praise you. Praise you for your goodness, your grace, your patience, your provisions that um, are given to us freely with no strings attached. And we lay before you our offerings, um, as well as an offering of us, our lives. We commit them to you, to your work, and your service. We ask that you use us as best um, suits the needs around us. Help us to um, see what is right in front of us, that you can... Um, in, enlighten us and help us to see the needs of others that we can respond to. And also, you know, we, we ask for healing for um, many of our people are ill and need your tender healing mercies. And we pray um, also for the, the children in school, but maybe not totally in school, we ask that you help them, help them to learn, help them to stretch, to grow, to see the wonder that is before them. Uh, and also, we lift up our pastor, um, Gresford Thomas, bless his words that he's um, going to deliver to us today, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And coming up next is a special music, and we're so delighted that you have come to uh, visit, to stay with us for this brief um, service, and uh, continue to worship and praise God.
The title of my message today is Remember Lot's Wife. Now, I'd like to start by talking about what some may consider to be a strange topic. Mummies. I'm not talking about this type of mummy. I'm talking more about this type of mummy. Now, when we think of this type of mummy, and, and here's a picture of, a, a, of an Egyptian uh, mummy, you usually think of horror movies. But in ancient times, specifically in the, in the times of the Bible, or the times of, uh, if you go back to Joseph and, and Jacob, when Joseph was ruling over Egypt, uh, there was a specific reason and process behind the creation of a, of a mummy, of mummification, if you will. The Egyptians believed that, that when a person died, they made a journey to the next world. And so they also believed that in order to make this journey and live in the next world, their body had to be preserved. This belief led to the process of mummification or preserving of the body. Now mummification, from the little research I've done, it's a 70-day process where a dead body goes through a, a series of, of procedures to ensure that the deceased will endure the test of time. And from pictures that I, I saw, I didn't want to share those type of pictures, but from pictures that I saw, uh, mummification was quite effective. And to this day, mummies are periodically found in tombs excavated in Egypt, other places as well. Now, the ancient Egyptians were concerned about preserving the body for the next life. But apart from preserving the body, ancient Egyptians who went through the mummification process had their worldly possessions buried with them. Now, the Bible speaks of mummification in some areas, as, such as at the end of Genesis. I talked about this just a few seconds ago, where we see Jacob and Joseph go through the process of mummification. Now, today we're going to talk about something that uh, I like to, uh, that I've coined a phrase to say, uh, spiritual mummification. It's, it's, it's a term that I phrase, a process by, where, by which the natural life is put to rest and the spiritual life is encouraged to thrive. It's something when we, that happens when we come to a relationship in Jesus Christ. The natural is put to rest, the spiritual is thriving. And I'm not talking about some ethereal thing, I'm talking about the life you now live, you live through Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking today at Luke 17, and, and what Jesus proposes in Luke 17 is, is instead of working to preserve what we have accumulated on earth, such as what happened in the time of the Egyptians, they, they took all their possessions, they mummified the person, and put it all with them so that they can preserve not only their body, but all of their possessions. Jesus is saying, don't worry about preserving what you've accumulated on earth. In fact, you should be willing to lose all of it in order to preserve the entrance of the Holy Spirit into our hearts and eventually to receive the reward that God has given to us when he comes, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. This is the principle, the foundational principle of discipleship. We're going to turn to Luke 17, chapter 20, but before we do, please uh, bow your heads with me before we go into the Word of God. Father in heaven, we are just so thankful today for the opportunity to open and study your Word. We pray, Father, that as we look at the words of Jesus, the words that he spoke to us, that you would open our hearts and minds that we may receive, not what I'm saying, but what Jesus is saying, what the Spirit is revealing. We thank you and, and praise you for the opportunity to be able to meet together remotely. And we just pray for your blessings in this short time together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Luke chapter 17 and verse 20. We're going to be looking at Luke 17 verse 20. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, and, and here's what it says. 
It's the beginning of a narrative talking about the coming of the kingdom. Now, Jesus is, is now uh, coming and, and, and confronting the Pharisees, but, but from my reading of it, it looks like a little different type of confrontation. Here's what it says, Luke 17, verse 20. It says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. I want to stop there for a moment before I go to verse 21 because in this narrative, he, he's, he's approached by a group of, uh, from what I see, curious Pharisees. Now, they're looking for a physical kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom, which is what Jesus wanted to establish, a kingdom not made with the hands of men, but made by the indwelling of the Spirit. But they were looking for a kingdom that was going to uh, overcome the, the, uh, the ruling of the Roman Empire over the Jewish people. Now, in most encounters, as, as we look at the Pharisees and, and Jesus coming into uh, confrontation or, or coming to, into conversation with one another, what we see is that the Pharisees are usually looking to, to trap or, or attack him. But in this text, I, I see something a little more simple, even uh, I would go as far to say innocent. I don't observe an, at an attack or an interrogation. Instead, it's, it, it's a request, a, a question, a, a consultation. It says he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom would come. These men wanted to know, okay, we, we see what you're doing. We see what you're saying. We see who you claim to be. Show us the kingdom. They, they were sincerely asking about the entrance of the kingdom of God. And from their understanding, their, their limited understanding of God's kingdom, they wanted to, to, to know what signs they should look for in order to know when that day would come. You claim to be the one who will usher it in. Show us, tell us. We've read about it. We know what the, our scriptures tell us. You tell us what you are uh, you are going to usher in as the kingdom is coming. You see, friends, these men whom we often demonize, I believe right now they're, they're sincerely searching. They're looking for something. They may not be looking for the right thing, but, but they're looking for the kingdom. You know, moments like these, as I read in Scripture, it, 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 they're irresistible to Jesus. Jesus always uh, went by this premise. I love this verse in Matthew 6, 33, where it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom. These men were, were seeking the kingdom. They were seeking God's kingdom, and, and Jesus wanted nothing more. He wanted nothing more that they accept God's kingdom in the way that it was meant to be embraced. That they would accept him as their king and allow his spirit to enter their lives and to change them. You know, the same is true for us today. Jesus loves to, to engage us. He, he loves when we ask questions. Some, sometimes we, we, we feel like we can't question what's in Scripture, but, but Jesus loves, to, to, loves it when we look at Scripture and, and want to know the answers, want to understand things in our heart of hearts. He wants to answer the big questions in, in our lives. What is my purpose in life? He, he wants to answer that question. Why is life so hard and difficult sometimes? He, he wants to be there as you engage in that question. When will COVID-19 be over? He wants us to also engage as, as we try to understand what's happening in this world with, with, this, um, with this virus and all the new mutations that seem to be coming. When can we come back and, and meet together? Jesus wants to engage even these questions that, that seem to be trivial. He cares. He wants to know. He wants us to know and to engage with him. He wants to be with us in the midst of our problems, of our confusion. He wants to journey with us through life. Is it any wonder that he said in Matthew 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, 
and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. This is what I see the Pharisees doing here. They're they're simply asking. They're asking the, the most significant question in the life of a Jew during that time. And Jesus answers the question. Just as he answered the Pharisees, he will answer us. As we search for answers to life's toughest questions, he will lead us as we seek him. As we knock on the, on the doors of potential opportunities that he opens for us individually and as a church, even during this time of, of lockdown, he will open doors. He will show us ways out of problems. But in order for this to happen, friends, we must take action. And that action is, is what the Pharisees did. They, they went out seeking Jesus, not, not looking to trap him at this time. They just had a simple question. The Pharisees knew the Scriptures. They, they knew the law, but they came to Jesus to see what his perspective was. Too many times we open our Bibles looking for answers without seeking the one of whom the pages testify. Sometimes we're looking for answers and we don't even know the question. We, we want to prove a, a point instead of being pointed in the direction of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We pray in, in Jesus' name without consulting him concerning what his will or, or desire might be for us. Friends, we are called to seek Jesus. We are called to open the Word of God with the intent of seeing a fuller revelation of who He is and what He desires for us. As we focus on Jesus and learn to trust Him, we will find peace and resolution in the pages of this Word. I think of the words of the Apostle Paul in Acts 17:28. He was there on on Mars Hill, and and he's talking to all of these individuals who believed in other gods. And and they had a a statue as he's walking through their their, their pantheon of gods, and and they're showing that uh, this is the the god of fertility. This is the god that helps produce uh, 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 different uh, crops and and agriculture. This is another god that that, uh, does other things. And and then they see um, uh, another statue where it was a statue to an unknown god, just in case they missed one. This God didn't have a, a, a purpose, but it was an unknown God. And, 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 and Paul took opportunity and he said, look, I, I, I can tell you about this God. This is the creator God, the, the God that created heaven and earth. And this is what I'll tell you about him. As it says in Acts 17, 28, it says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring." Friends, the Bible takes on a life of its own as we see it through the lens of Jesus Christ. We'll be able to live and move through Him. Life situations are are best understood and, and resolved through that perspective of Jesus. In Luke 17, somehow the Pharisees understood that there was something special about this man. Even though they were opposed to him and and, and wanted uh, to do away with him, there were some, and we think of Nicodemus, who came to him by night and had a very intimate discussion with him about matters of the law, and, and Joseph of Arimathea, who provided a tomb for him. There were Pharisees who looked to Jesus and, and said, there's something about this man. And we are called to have that same spiritual curiosity. Let's go back to Luke chapter 17. I'm going to look at verse 21 now. Because we've only looked at verse 20 where where he uh, offered really no sign there. He offered no series of events leading to the establishment of the kingdom. Instead, he tells them something rather cryptic. Luke 17, 21. It says, Nor will they say, see here, 
or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. And what that means is among you or in your presence. What he's saying is that the kingdom of God is standing right in front of you. The closeness of of God's kingdom or or the reign of, of, of God as king is determined by your closeness to me. As you come to know me as friend, as you allow me into your life, the kingdom of God just in, uh, wraps itself around you. You know, an, an exact translation of what Jesus was saying here would be as follows. The kingdom of God is as close to you as you are to me. What Jesus was revealing to the Pharisees is the coming of the kingdom is not dependent on signs, but it is ultimately dependent on the relationship of the residents of the kingdom with its king. The kingdom of heaven has nothing to do with physical power. Instead, the kingdom of heaven is revealed to those who surrender the power of self and find strength in their relationship with Jesus. Friends, right now as we await the second coming of Jesus Christ, we we often get caught up in being residents of heaven, of a a physical kingdom, of of walking those golden streets, of of eating from the tree of life, a different fruit for every month, of of traveling to other planets. Some people have, uh, have heard talk about that, and the list goes on of all the things we like to do when we get there. But what Jesus is telling us in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, is it's not about seeing this thing or that thing. It's not about being in this place or that place. It's not about experiencing another event. The kingdom of heaven is solely about being within a close proximity of Jesus. It's relational in nature. You know, my 10 years of marriage to my my lovely wife, Elia, We've lived in tiny apartments, and now we live in a larger home. We're going to be moving to the area up here in the Contra Costa County very, very soon. We're, we're looking into that, and we'll be doing that soon. And, and we've lived in, here in sunny California, not so sunny right now, but it, it, sunny California most of the time. And, and we've spent time living in, in, in Michigan where, where snow is the, or seems to be uh, the order of the day most of the time. But, but throughout the time that we've been together, it's never been about the place that we've lived. It's been about the journey we've shared together as a couple. It's been about the relationship. In the same way, friends, the kingdom of heaven is not about finding a path to paradise. It's about finding a path to the feet of Jesus. This is what Jesus wanted the Pharisees to understand. You you seek a physical kingdom, but but I want so much more for you. I want so much more than than, than just uh, the the Jewish nation ruling over the world. I want to be with you, and I want you to be with me. In fact, I want to be in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Verse 21 of Luke 17, it it, it ends his conversation with the Pharisees. Now here he had given them a clear picture of what the kingdom of God was about, but now the ball was in their court. So in verse 22, what we see is he he turns his attention to his disciples. And I'm going to be reading verses 22 to 30, because what he had just explained to the Pharisees was of the utmost importance. Every time Jesus had a conversation with a Pharisee or... or, um, or, or someone else, a Syrophoenician woman, or whoever it was he was having a conversation with, and the, and the disciples were all around, what Jesus always did is he pivoted back to the disciples because he wanted them to gain a lesson from that interaction he had. Even with the woman at the well. woman at the well, the disciples were not there. They went to, to get uh, some food. And when they came back, even though they had not witnessed the conversation, he still wanted them to gain a lesson from what happened. Jesus is always teaching. He's always desiring for us to grow as we spend time with him. 
So in verses 22 to 30, we're going to see the lessons that he wants the disciples to pull out of what just happened in those two verses with the Pharisees. Defining the kingdom of God was something the disciples needed to fully understand in order to be true, sincere followers of Jesus. He wanted them to be prepared for when he left. The disciples were following Jesus because he had words of life. And Jesus knew that they were also following him because they were longing for a physical kingdom. And he wanted to switch the script on them. So here's what he says to his disciples, starting in verse 22. It's, here's what it says. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Very important lesson he wanted for them to learn. In these verses, he warns his disciples of the same thing that he warned the Pharisees. Except now he's, he's giving them these, these, uh, these object lessons through Lot and also through Noah. He told them not to look for physical signs, but to be like Noah and Lot. According to the scripture, Noah and Lot were engaged in the day-to-day -day of life. Eating. Drinking, we, we do it every day. Selling, buying, even during a pandemic, right? These are things that, that we, we need to do. Life was moving forward, but, but when the time came to make a decision, both Noah and Lot made the decision to leave that life. Now, Lot had to be coerced a little bit, but he still left Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible tells us that, that Noah entered the ark when God said to enter, he built the ark based on faith that it never rained before, but he built that ark and then he entered the ark and let God close the door. And in the same way, we are told Lot went out of Sodom. When the angels came and told him the city will be destroyed, Lot was reluctant, but as the fire and brimstone started to come and the angel grabbed his hand and, and pulled him out, Lot left that city. In other words, when the time came to make a decision to be part of, of God's kingdom, to be on God's team, they made the critical decision to follow him. When the time came for, for them to show who they were aligned with, they were ready to make a move. Friends, we, we live in a, in a world today where, where things are moving infinitely faster than they were back in the days of Noah or Lot. We are busy with so many different things in life, even during a pandemic. But, but the question is, when the time comes to make a decision for abundant life with Jesus, will we choose to be with him? Noah chose to enter the ark of safety. He chose to be safe in the arms of God. Through his years of eating and drinking and, and building these routine things he did on a daily basis, he was also developing his relationship with God to the point that when God called him into the ark of safety, there was no hesitation. 
Lot, even though it, it may look like he, he, he wasn't ready, he behaved in a, in a similar fashion. Yes, he lived in the worst city on the planet and he made a decision to be there. But when that angel grabbed his hand and pulled him out of Sodom, he trusted enough to leave the city. So when Jesus compared the time of, of the coming of the Son of Man, he was, he was sharing the urgency of being ready for his coming. Readiness in this text simply means taking time to connect with Jesus on a meaningful level. Sometimes we think it's something we have to do, but it's someone we need to know. This is what discipleship is all about. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Being ready for the kingdom of God means we are actively developing our connection with Jesus daily. It means understanding that the kingdom is among us. This is the choice God desires for us as we await the coming of his kingdom. But as we continue reading the text in Luke, we see that there is another option. We're going to look at verses 32 and 33 now. Verses 32 and, and 33. Here's what it says. It says very simply, as, as he's talking about the urgency of being, of being ready, of, of connecting with him, he says, remember Lot's wife. He talked about Lot and what Lot did, but then he says, remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. At the beginning of my message, I mentioned a process of mummification. An, an important aspect of, of this process, friends, is uh, for the Egyptians is the fact that it was done for the purpose of preserving the body for the next life. And, and though we, we, we don't believe in any kind of afterlife in that fashion, we do believe in eternal life with Jesus. And in the same way that, that they were preserving that body, for an afterlife, we need to be preserving ourselves for eternal life. After Jesus spoke about the, the importance of preserving a relationship, he stated these words, remember Lot's wife. What was there to remember about Lot's wife? If you remember back in, in, in Genesis, the Bible tells us that she was turned into a pillar of salt. Now, when we think of salt, we usually think of something that needs to be seasoned. My wife often, when she's making something, not enough salt, and she, she loves to, to add that salt to, to a lot of the dishes. I'm, I'm not one that likes the seasoning of salt, but, but she loves it. Salt, salt we see, is, is something that is a, a seasoning. So, so when the disciples were, were asked to remember Lot's wife, they were also being reminded that they were the salt of the earth. They were to season the earth with the presence of Jesus. And, and also, as they think of remembering Lot's wife, they, they remember the fact that the reason why she was turned into a pillar of salt is that they were told, Lot was told, with his wife and his daughters who left, that when you leave that city, don't look back. Just go. Don't turn your back. And Lot's wife, Lot's wife, though physically she was out of that city, here in her heart, she was still in Sodom and Gomorrah. She looked back longingly at that city, thinking of the relationship she had forged there, the life that she had uh, established there, all the things that were there that, that, that she was leaving for who knows where. I believe they thought that it was the end of the world. And they're leaving this place not knowing where they're going. And, and she looked back longingly, one more look, and, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. And that pillar of salt was used here by Jesus Christ to give this particular message to his disciples. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life, whoever puts themselves in the arms of Jesus, will preserve it. 
That is another use for salt. We don't use salt for that much these days. We have refrigeration. But, but back in the time of, disciples, of the disciples, salt was used primarily for that, for, for preserving food. And Jesus is saying if you want to preserve your life, if you want your life to, to have the, 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 the fullness of, of, of a quality and, 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 and of, of quality and abundance that you can ever have on this, on this world, come to me. Come seek a relationship with me. Salt was also used as a, a unit of exchange. Salt was valuable. It's where we get our word salary. Because in the time of Rome, the, the, sometimes the soldiers were paid with salt. It had value to it. And in the same way, a relationship with Jesus has so much value to it. Our example of how we live our lives can exchange death for life. And, and in the teachings of Jesus, we see him continually refer to, to salt. He sees it as a seasoning. And here in Luke, he sees it as a preservative. Friends, during COVID-19, we're called to remember Lot's wife. Yes, we are sheltering in place, but we also have, that gives us a unique opportunity to seek God in, in ways that we were not able to before. It, even though we're together in, in, during our Sabbath school, which we have uh, prior to our, our service, let us take time to preserve our relationship with Jesus now so that when we come out of this, and we will, we could be a sweet seasoning to one another, a sweet seasoning to the world for His glory. May we always remember Lot's wife, not because of the tragedy, but because of the victory that we can have as we put our eyes and put our confidence in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are just so thankful for the many lessons and opportunities you give us to grow and to, to learn more about you. We are thankful, Lord, for uh, this lesson of, of learning, remembering Lot's wife. Lord, I, I pray that every, everyone in the sound of my voice will make a decision to put you first, to follow you, to seek you first, to allow their lives to be preserved by allowing your presence to dwell within. So Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit to, to guide us to to open up and read your word, to take time in, in prayer and, and to seek opportunities just to connect with one another because we know the, the value and the joy that could come with that. Oh God, we, we just give you glory and praise for guiding us and for being with us through this worship time. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to each one of you. And may he give you peace. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, have a blessed rest of your day. And we will see you next week.